few months before I got married, I decided that I wanted to see the inside of a mikvah because I was considering taking on that mitzvah. For those of you that don't know, a mikvah is a ritual bath. It can be used during conversion, but it is also used by women, usually married women. Um, after they complete their menstrual cycle, they, they have separated themselves from their husband during that time. And after they finish their cycle, they immerse in the purifying waters of the mikvah, and then they can reunite with their husbands. And I was considering this mitzvah, but I had grown up in a reform home, and I didn't know a lot about it. And for those sidebar, for those of you who are wondering why an empowered young woman would engage in such an archaic ritual, that's a story for another time. I'd be happy to share with you. But I was studying in Jerusalem at the time, and I had a teacher who I was friendly with, and she was Orthodox. I asked her if she would take me with her to the mikvah so that I could see it for myself before making a decision about using the mikvah. So she did. We went very late at night. The mikvah was almost getting ready to close. And she went and spoke to the attendant at the front desk, who immediately started screaming at us in Hebrew. <laughs> and my Hebrew wasn't very good, so I couldn't understand what had upset her. I'll get back to that. Uh, but I remember how it made me feel. I felt like I didn't belong there. I felt totally excluded from something that I had approached with an open mind and an open heart. And I felt, I felt lonely and I felt ashamed. All of us have had that experience of being excluded. And during Rosh Hashanah, we read the story of Hagar. We read it yesterday morning. She is the epitome of exclusion. When we start the story, whenever she's mentioned in Abraham's house, it's with a label. Hagar the slave. Hagar the Egyptian. It's somewhat like I've heard us describing people with labels or how I've described people with labels. You know that kind of conversation where you say, oh, I was talking to Solomon. Who's Solomon? Oh, he's the old guy, right? We've immediately labeled him. And maybe what we mean by old guy is someone who moves more slowly, someone who doesn't hear as well, well someone who can't see as well. We, th we think in terms, when we label someone, of all the inconveniences that accompany them. But what a label doesn't tell us is Solomon. He's been a member for eight million years. He knows every nook and cranny of this place. He knows how all of the family and friends are interrelated. He has our institutional memory. That's what we lack when we label someone. So Hagar is labeled in the story as a slave. She's cast out by her family. And the next thing that we see is her wandering in the wilderness, weeping. I think that, too, describes an experience of being excluded, to wander in the wilderness, weeping. I'd like to share with you some words written by David Wills, the son of Debbie and John Wills. He wrote them as a child in elementary school, and he's describing his experience learning to cope with dyslexia. He writes, spelling is hard for me because there are lots of letters in one word, which are very hard for me to remember. When I take my pretest, I usually get a minus three or even more. But on the actual test, I almost always make 100. Then I feel proud of myself, but everyone else has the same grade. And then I feel that I should have been able to do it before the pretest because my friends say they didn't even have to study and they make 100 on their pretests. Can you hear in the sorrow of this boy as he wanders in the wilderness, not being like everyone else, feeling lonely? By the way, interestingly enough, David not only went on to be a superb martial arts instructor, but he's a yeshiva booker. He spends his day reading texts. He turned into a scholar who reads all day long. Further on in the Hagar story, we see God open up Hagar's eyes to the well. It was right in front of her the whole time, but he has to send an angel to her to say, see, there is water for you too. And then he tells her, 
your son Ishmael will be a mighty nation as well as Isaac. In other words, Hagar, it's not how you envisioned it would be, but it will be wonderful in its own way. Now that we've explored <clears throat> a little bit in the Torah, the theme of exclusion, let's talk about how it plays out in our world. There was a Supreme Court case, Casey Martin versus the PGA. Casey Martin is a golfer. He still golfs, he lives in Oregon. He's very good. He wanted to play in a PGA tournament, but he has a circulatory uh, health problem and it's dangerous for him to walk very long. So he petitioned the PGA, PGA to use a golf cart, and they said no. He sued them under the American with Disabilities Act, and it went all the way to the Supreme Court. They had to unravel two things. The first was, is a golf course a public space, therefore obligating the PGA to accommodate those who do not move the way the rest of us move? And they had to determine whether the walking was an integral part of the game or whether the important part is being able to hit a very tiny ball a very long way into a very small hole. And in the end, <laughs> the Supreme Court sided with Mr. Martin and they had to accommodate him with a golf cart. What troubles me about this story is this is often how inclusion plays out. It's not that people automatically include, it's that we have to fight Someone who needs inclusion has to say, I need this, you are obligated to provide it for me and I'm not going to let you get away with it. I see it happen in the Jewish community sometimes. At one of the synagogues where I work, I was meeting with families over the summer to get to know the student body of the school better. And it became apparent to me pretty quickly that we had a significant number of children struggling with dyslexia or ADHD or somewhere on the autism spectrum. So I went to our education committee and I said, we need to hire a special education teacher to support the needs of our students. And one woman said, well, that sounds very expensive to me. I said, yes, we, we do need to stay within our budget. I agree with you. So what I've done is I think we'll combine these two classes because they're small and that will give us the extra funding we need to hire the teacher who's going to meet the needs of our students. She said, well, it, you know, it sounds like you're trying to be all things to all people. I said, well, I, I understand that point of view. I'm not trying to be all things to all people. I'm trying to provide a good education to the students we already have in our school. And finally, she got to what was on her mind. She said, I just don't understand how this will help my normal child. So I kept my politician's hat on, and I clarified for her that her child would benefit because when we meet the needs of our students, they're less likely to act out in class, and the class as a whole can progress through the material more quickly. And we did get that special education teacher, and I was backed up by other members of the education committee, but we had to fight for it. Now let's look at a different scenario, a beautiful organic inclusion scenario. In Israel, the military was having a problem. They have these very wonderful satellites that can take very good pictures across enemy lines. But that information isn't helpful unless someone analyzes the data. And people were supposed to pour over photographs and notice minute changes in the photographs. Well, they tried to put their best and the brightest on the case but they couldn't do it. They couldn't concentrate on that minute detail long enough. And the general who was in charge of this program was speaking to his neighbor about the difficulty, and the neighbor had a child who was autistic. And he said, you know, one of the ways autism can manifest is an autistic person is sometimes able to concentrate extremely well on minute detail for a long time. And what's more, the way that an autistic mind sometimes works is they don't fill in a background story to make them gloss over details they should notice. They just analyze the raw data. They can see it as it is. And as a result, there is now a unit. It's part of the intelligence of the military in Israel. It is made up completely of aut soldiers with autism. And they are providing incredibly useful information to the Israeli military. Not only that, but it gives the military an opportunity to give back to the soldiers. 
and they have psychologists and social workers who come and work with the unit on their social skills so that when these young men and women finish the army, they all will have the ability to be more successful in a job search and live independently. It can play out this way in Jewish settings too. I'd like to tell you the beautiful story of Pamela Schuler. Now this story was brought to my attention by our educator, Barry Schweitzer. She put it on Facebook. Pamela Schuler gave an Eli talk. It's like a TED talk, but with a Jewish twist. I highly recommend them. So Pamela is now part of youth engagement in the reform movement. And she tells her story. She has Tourette's, which is a neurological disorder that causes a person to involuntarily make certain sounds or, or motions. She was kicked out of Hebrew school at a pretty young age. She was considered too disruptive. And she said when that happened to her, she felt that not only was she being rejected by her school, but she was being rejected by the Jewish community as a whole. Fortunately, she decided she wanted to work at a summer camp. She loved working with children. And she went to the interview, and she did not have to tell them that she had Tourette's because she had a severe case, and it became apparent pretty quickly in the interview that she had this disorder. And they said, we take the Tselem Elohim, that all creatures are created in the image of God, very seriously here. And we're going to find a way for you to be included, and we would like to hire you because we can see how much love you have for children. Now, this isn't always the case with people with Tourette's, but in her case, she, um, she would shout out expletives, specifically the F word, at random times, uncontrollably. And the way the camp decided to deal with it was with humor. So any time that Pamela would say the F word, the children would fill in, it's a bad word. <laughs> and everyone would laugh with her, not at her, and they'd get on with their day. And she was a wonderful counselor and got very interested in pursuing Jewish education and now helps engage Jewish youth. So thank goodness. I think you heard from our president a little bit today. Alan told us how we are a part of the Ruderman inclusion movement. But I wanted to make a comment about Our Doors too, which is the psalm that we sang this morning as we were putting the Torah away says, lift high your lintels, O you gates, open wide your doors and admit the God of glory. What more beautiful symbol of Beth Torah's desire to be inclusive than that our doors now open to those that need the doors to open. It's wonderful, and I've been hearing that psalm in my head since we installed them about 10 days ago, maybe a week ago. The other thing I wanted to let you know about that makes me so proud is this year in our learning center, we've decided that every student needs individual tutoring. So on Wednesdays, thanks to a core of very dedicated volunteers, each child will receive 20 minutes of one-on-one -on -one learning. That way, we can make sure that we're addressing all of their needs as individuals. You see, being inclusive is not just taking these actions. It's changing our mindset, and it's opening our eyes. It can extend beyond noticing someone who's having trouble moving or hearing or participating. It can extend to asking ourselves, she's a single mom, isn't she? I wonder how she gets her child to Hebrew school. Maybe I should ask her if she needs any help. I don't think she was born Jewish. I, I think she chose Judaism. I wonder if she has a place to go for the holidays since she doesn't have a Jewish family. Maybe we should invite her to our Seder. It's noticing so-and-so always seems to sit alone at Kiddush. I, I would like to go and sit with her today. It's changing our mindset to be more inclusive of the stranger. My friend Rabbi Susan Leiter, who's a rabbi in Marin County, was talking to me about the traditional Rosh Hashanah greeting, Lishana Tova Tikatehu, may you be inscribed for a good year. She said that Hasidic Jews take this quite literally, that when you express, may you be inscribed for a good year to another person, you're making it so that when you look in another human being's face and see the image of God, then indeed they will be inscribed in the Book of Life. So back to me at the mikvah with this woman <laughs> screaming at me in Hebrew. It turned out she was actually screaming because she wanted to be inclusive. 
What had happened was, because we'd come at the end of the night, she felt that the mikvah looked a little disheveled. There was a bit of water on the floor, and the towels were piled up in the laundry room. And she was worried that I would reject this part of our culture and say, ugh, I don't, I don't want to use the mikvah. And she was telling my teacher, you have to bring her back at the beginning of the night when everything is clean and neat and orderly. <laughs> so, um, and, and indeed, I, I do use the mikvah and would be happy to talk to you about why. But my blessing for us this year is that all of our feelings of exclusion turn out to be simple misunderstandings easily clarified and that none of us feel like Hagar wandering in the wilderness. Chag Sameach.